<laughs> Wonderful. Well, welcome, folks, to the Northeastern IPM uh, Center Toolbox series. And uh, this is the last of our spring um, uh, toolbox uh, webinars. And uh, we're delighted to have Whitney Crenshaw with us from, um, uh, from Colorado. And he's going to be talking to us about um, industrial hemp IPM. So um, uh, our recording of this will be available. So um, don't worry about writing lots and lots of notes. It takes us about a week for us to edit and post the recording and it'll be available on this uh, link. And also anyone who is registered uh, will get a copy of the, of the recording. And next slide. All right, so um, we'd love to have questions. We love for these to be interactive and we have somebody who is monitoring the questions. And I'd like to ask you to use the Q&A feature. So if you scroll over your screen where you see the webinar, you'll see there's a, a box that shows up either at the top or at the bottom uh, with um, different things you can click on. And in the middle, there's a box that says Q&A. And if you click on that, um, you can ask a question. The advantage for us of doing this over to the chat feature is uh, we can mark when they've been, um, when they've been answered and we can be able to sort them more uh, easily than we can in chat where there's just, especially when there's a lot of questions, it's hard to keep track of them. And so using them in the chat feature, um, in the Q&A feature really does help us out. So um, next slide, please. Oh, the other advantage, by the way, of uh, the Q&A feature is you can ask questions anonymously. So please feel free just to anonymize your question. And uh, I'm really delighted to have uh, Whitney Crenshaw here with us today from Colorado State. Usually our presenters are from the Northeast and so we're delighted to have someone from the West. Um, he's a broad, uh, Whitney Crenshaw is a professor and extension specialist at Colorado State University. He's broad research interests related to IPM of all arthropods affecting horticultural commodities. His recent research includes a project to describe the insect mite pests of hemp and identify pest management needs. He developed the Hemp Insect website and the Insect Information website, which consolidate much of the material used um, in extension programming. And uh, they're rich resources for you, and I'm sure he'll provide links during the course of this presentation. So next slide, please. Great, thank you. So uh, before we dive in, we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, we are, of course, uh, uh, steeped in academia. We can't help ourselves. Um, it partly helps us to know where you're calling from, and um, but also your level of expertise, and that helps uh, Whitney when he's doing his presentation. So you should see up in front of you some polling questions. Um, there is There are no wrong answers. If you have no clue, just, uh, just don't so just pick one randomly, it doesn't matter. And, uh, and at the end of the presentation, we'll go over uh, which ones are correct and why. And so I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes uh, to answer these questions and I'll be quiet while you do that. Okay, so it looks as if 78% of you have had a chance to vote. So let's uh, share the results. Okay. So um, you can see we've got a pretty good spread actually of uh, people with 36% um, with not knowledgeable at all or 35 uh, somewhat knowledgeable. So I've got most people on that spectrum. We have a few people who are very knowledgeable, which is great. And then um, we actually have quite a few people from, we actually have more people from the West uh, than we do from the Northeast on the call, and uh, which is probably understandable and a smattering of uh, South and Midwest, and we have three Canadians, so good for you Canadians. And um, the other questions we will cover when we, when we get to the end, and um, Whitney, you might be interested in this, is that 70% have not visited uh, the Hemp Insect website um, at Colorado State. So, okay. all right, so we'll stop sharing. And uh, with that, Whitney, uh, we'll have you dive in with your presentation and thank you so very much for taking the time to do this today. You bet. Let me see. I'm trying to get to the next one here. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right. So um, the uh, topic here will be mostly uh, discussing the insects that we're seeing on, on hemp. Now hemp is a, an old crop, but in its new renaissance, it's a very different thing than we've ever had before in North America. It's being grown in different places for different uses and in different ways. So the first thing I want to uh, go over is um, what kind of crop is hemp in this new era? Because it's not uh, 
a simple kind of crop that was grown uh, in World War II. It is uh, uh, a couple of different crops. Um, now, hemp overall, if we were to uh, des describe it, it, is some sort of cannabis species crop that has low levels of THC. I mean, that's the broadest definition. They have to have less than 0.3% by dry weight. Uh, that's what makes it hemp. Uh, don't ask why it's 0.3%. It's a magic number, but that's the way it is. And in terms of the kind of insect issues and mite issues, um, it's at least three different crops. Uh, so I want to talk about hemp, that if you're growing it for seed and or fiber, uh, you will have a certain set of issues. You'll have a different set of issues if you're growing primarily for CBD. And if you have an indoor production phase, um, you're going to have to see uh, hemp having uh, certain kinds of problems you would not see if you, you were growing it outdoors and vice versa. Um, the uh, uh, hemp being grown for fiber and or seed, that would be you know, classic hemp. Um, it would be grown for fiber. You're going to have uh, quite high plant populations. You want long, uh, narrow plant that you can extract uh, usable fiber for. These are all being grown by seeding. You're going to have um, uh, usually very, very high uh, plant populations. Um, and uh, it is going to be a mixture of, of male and female plants. Uh, uh, it may be, uh, there may be uh, monoecious plants that have got both sexes on it, but you'll have uh, flowering, you'll have pollen. Uh, although this is wind pollinated um, crop, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the pollen being used by various kinds of insects too. So in this system, lots of plants, uh, pollen, seeds, uh, but most people presently are growing it for CBD. And when you grow in hemp for CBD, it's an entirely different crop. It's more of a horticultural crop, more like a nursery crop in some respects. So uh, it differs quite a bit. Presently, although this is changing, almost all of the CBD uh, kinds of crops have involved use of transplanted clones. Um, and as a result, there is going to be a greenhouse phase. Uh, uh, so there's going to be some sort of live plants maintained year round. And when you have this kind of system, uh, certain kinds of uh, pests can be carried over from crop to crop uh, more easily. So often there'll be a mother plant that you get uh, rooted cuttings from, and then you use these to produce transplants. The ultimate uh, product you're going to be getting uh, is often a very enlarged um, bud, uh, the female flower uh, that has not uh, been poll uh, pollinated, ideally, so it becomes grossly enlarged. Um, so you are using, typically in these systems, all female clones. No pollen is involved. Uh, um, so uh, big unfertilized buds, often really sticky at harvest, uh, sometimes so sticky it makes harvest quite difficult and probably also uh, complicates things for some insects that visit the plant uh, late in the, the growing season. Um, it's um, often uh, got very um, wide in-row spacing and you're growing a bushy plant, not a tall plant, a bushy plant often with lots of flower buds. Uh, so very different looking plant uh, uh, when you're growing in this system. And again, this is almost all of what is being grown uh, in, in most of the United States at this point when we're talking about hemp. Now there are dual use crops, uh, ones that could be grown for CBD or, and seed. So in this case, you would have pollination. Um, these would be maybe lower percentage of CBD, but often higher biomass. And, and increasingly, we're gonna be seeing uh, more use of this, uh, of, of CBD crops grown from seed because the genetics are getting more stabilized. That's the big issue with uh, why people had to use do, do transplants because uh, if your THC levels go up above 0.03%, you don't have hemp anymore. You just have a crappy pot and you got to destroy it. So um, that's, now we're going for seeded uh, uh, cultivars increasingly. Anyway, getting to the main point. Uh, what we need to do in this new era is develop um, uh, insect and mite pest management uh, systems for this crop and to get to the point where we can have real good IPM prog uh, programs, uh, we, we have some uh, background work to do and I see us having to go through uh, three stages, um, a descriptive stage where we figure out what we actually have as issues, 
then we move into the development stage to address the uh, outstanding issues um, that uh, uh, are associated with the key pests. And then we can work in uh, producing some implementation uh, for IPM. So with the current era, what are the kinds of uh, arthropods are going to be found uh, in North American hemp in, uh, right now uh, with this renaissance we're, we're having. And we don't have a lot to uh, help guide us. Uh, pretty much the only time hemp was grown or the last time hemp was grown in any large uh, acreage in North America was in the World War II era. Uh, and since then it's uh, had very restricted uh, uh, production and essentially none until uh, the last four or five years. Um, and during that time, the kinds of insect issues uh, were barely discussed. Um, so these would be some extension bulletins from that era, and there would be a few paragraphs perhaps on a couple of different insects. So they don't provide us much help in this new era with what's, what are the problems and how do we deal with them. There is an excellent book um, kind of summarizing all the kinds of uh, insects and pathogens uh, associated with hemp. Um, and uh, this was put out in 2000. It, it is, a, again, a very good book, but there's relatively few references to the North American situation because uh, hemp insects have never really been studied in North America because it's been prohibited uh, until recent changes in the farm bill. No university uh, uh, could really get involved in this. So we have a lot of catching up to do. So when I when we approach this, so I've been I've been looking at hemp fields now for four or five years, and uh, because it's it's a little easier to to do that here in Colorado because of some state laws and constitutional amendment uh, passed in 2012. But the first question you know, when I visit hemp fields is what is a hemp insect? Uh, you know what what when because when you go in a lot of the, the insects you will see are transients and. Um, people send pictures to me about insects they've seen in hemp, and at least half of them are transients. They're just an insect that's in the crop because that's where it's resting, uh, but they came off of a, a weed or they came off from uh, some adjacent kind of uh, crop. So you always have to separate out what are the, the ones that are actually feeding on the plant, and, and then among those, which ones are actually important. And, and let me just uh, uh, give an example of how it can be complicated trying to figure out what is a hemp insect. Uh, so last, last spring in Southeast Colorado, we had an extremely dry, dry uh, year, very severe drought. And uh, a grower uh, contacted me about an, an insect that was a lace bug on the crop. Um, and uh, this was what the field looked like. And every single plant had uh, multiple lace bugs on this, the adult form. And this is something never heard of, uh, never seen before, and frankly, not since. Um, large numbers of eggs were produced. Uh, the, the adults were on the plant. The adults were feeding. And if you're aware of lace bug damage, uh, kind of damage you'd see was typical of that. A little bit of stippling and the like, uh, maybe some tar spots. But then what happened is nothing. The eggs hatch, but none of the nymphs develop. Few adults were found on the plants, but essentially these were adults that had laid eggs, but they, they could not sustain themselves on the plant. And the reason I think they were in hemp in this situation is because there was no other plants that were growing because of the drought, except in these irrigated fields. So the adults moved into hemp. They tried to make a go of it, but they didn't. So is that a hemp insect? Probably not. Um, but it shows it's a little complicated trying to figure out what are the ones to, to focus on. Also, uh, there will be several insects uh, that are associated with uh, ooze from wounds and uh, 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 in infections, various flies, uh, flower beetles, uh, the green June beetle in the east. Um, and, uh, um, and, and are these, uh, going, are these uh, uh, insects that are associated with hemp? Uh, I don't know. They're more associated with the ooze uh, that might occur from wounding rather than being a, a direct pest. And then obviously there is a uh, always going to be a, a natural enemy complex and uh, and hemp is no different uh, from most any other field crops in this regard. So you'll see um, a natural enemy complex 
uh, depending in part on what kind of insects are feeding on the crop. So pretty, pretty normal, but you know, there, there's lots of things. So for instance, lady beetles are what uh, most people will uh, see. And, and uh, the three most common ones around here are convergent lady beetle, seven spot, and the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Uh, in the east, you've got the pink spotted lady beetle. I hear that uh, pretty common uh, in hemp as well. Um, uh, I do uh, see some oddball ones, and I just threw this in because since this is going to uh, New York, one of the more common lady beetles uh, is the nine spotted lady beetle, the state insect of New York. I know you have a tough time trying to find your state insect in your state. So come out to uh, Colorado and check some hemp fields. They've got cannabis aphid on them and you might see a nine spotted lady beetle for the first time. Uh, lady beetle larvae, of course, are on that end. Um, I'm not sure if I can make these videos play here, but uh, the, uh, the growers are uh, often, um, uh, often baffled when they see these lady beetle larvae, as they are in other crops, and think that they're something terrible. Uh, but anyway, uh, and quite common uh, in, in the crop. Three species of lace wings so far we found. Um, I'm sure there's others uh, elsewhere, uh, and both the adults and the uh, uh, larvae uh, may be predaceous. At least some of the species are predaceous in the adult form. Flower flies, when we have uh, high numbers of uh, aphids. And then generalist hemipteran predators, various kinds of bugs. Um, uh, uh, might be assassin bugs or damsel bugs or minute pirate bugs. Uh, and some of these will be uh, found a little more commonly if we have some pollen on the crop. If I were to say uh, there's a, a, a predator that I see more commonly in hemp than anything else around here, it's, it's damsel bugs. Uh, uh, they're always in, in the crop. And again, there's, this is our local species. There's uh, uh, several species in North America, but all pretty much function the same way. And spiders. Spiders will move in. Uh, this is an annual crop, so uh, it uh, doesn't have the permanence that allows some spiders to do well, but uh, the uh, primary families that we're seeing uh, in this would be the uh, 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 running crab spiders, the, uh, the jumping spiders, the crab spiders, and the uh, tetrachnathan, the long-jawed spiders. Uh, so they're pretty common and probably quite important. And then hemp, if you have a hemp uh, uh, plant that is producing pollen, is or can be heavily used by bees, uh, all kinds of bees, not just honeybees, but bumblebees and uh, various kinds of solitary bees. Uh, this is uh, something that's very dramatic in our area um, where we do not have a lot of uh, alternate kinds of uh, pollen sources though late in the summer uh, and fields will just be alive with uh, bumblebees and honeybees mostly, but again, several other kinds of uh, uh, solitary bees as well. So this brings up kind of a, a little, um, another side issue on hemp in, in terms of its uh, value for pollinators. Uh, now, that being said, a uh, couple caveats. Uh, hemp, uh, the effect of, of hemp for uh, helping uh, as a pollen source depends on what kind of hemp you're, you're growing. If you're growing hemp that is producing pollen, then it is a pollen source. If you're growing CBD hemp that's all females, no, it's worthless for pollinators. Um, but uh, uh, it, and, and the, the importance of, of it as a pollen source will vary uh, depending on location. Uh, areas in the, in, in the Northeast uh, where you get good rainfall, you've got more flowering plants, more alternate food uh, uh, sources for bees late in the season than, than uh, typically we see out here in a more arid part of the country. But it is an outstanding uh, resource for pollen, uh, for pollinating, uh, for, for bees uh, out here. Now, getting into just what are we seeing, um, there are uh, some uh, insects and mites that we see on indoor uh, grown crops, and uh, we're able to you know, see these uh, uh, first off. Um, some of these are, are also, of course, uh, issues in marijuana, uh, which, but the, there's a couple of kinds of things you'd see on an indoor crop. Uh, Two-spotted spider mite. What, what crop doesn't two-spotted spider mite attack? Uh, a key pest on indoor grown uh, hemp. Uh, broad mite is uncommon, but it does occur. 
Again, this is a kind of widespread generalist insect you find in indoor crops. Thrips, uh, what I have found, the only ones I have found are onion thrips, not the Western flower thrips, uh, but onion thrips are uh, extremely common. Um, tobacco thrips are mentioned as another uh, thrips associated with the crop from the uh, southern US. And fungus gnats, again, indoor culture, you get uh, issues with uh, uh, fungus gnats on pretty much everything. Uh, but there are a couple things that are, are different. And one of the things that is, I, I, I was flabbergasted by, is seeing rice root aphid as, a, as an issue on indoor grown crops. Um, have uh, uh, often the way hemp is produced, this will probably not be an issue, and I've never seen it outdoors. But rice root aphid is shockingly common uh, in indoor uh, cannabis production and uh, a very new host record. Um, the uh, other two things that are quite common would be uh, hemp russet mite. This is a areophyid mite that lives on the surface of uh, cannabis leaves and an aphid. There's a couple aphids, but far and away the most common is the cannabis aphid. Now, uh, a couple of years ago when I was giving winter meetings, kind of talking about what I thought, you know, I was seeing and you know, gave my ideas, you know, I made the comment that, you know, pest pest problems associated with outdoor grown hemp will likely have very little overlap with those indoors because of all these natural enemies. You, you take a plant outside, things resolve itself because of natural enemies. Um, and I was at every meeting told, no, that's not always the case. Uh, there's at least two insects that transfer and will cause you problems outdoors uh, as well as indoors. And that would be the aphid and the russet mite. So, um, moving through kinds of the things you will see in this plant, um, kind of go through the various kinds of parts of the plant. Uh, I want to talk about what's on the leaves, what gets in the stalks, what gets in the flowers, the seeds, the buds, root feeders, very little information on that. And again, I've not seen the rice root aphid yet outdoors, but it's a difficult insect to look for. So uh, there undoubtedly will be ones, but I have not seen those yet. Um, probably the most obvious things to many people would be something that's chewing the leaves, some sort of defoliator. And we have uh, defoliators of, of all kinds uh, on the crop, uh, various kinds of caterpillars, various beetles, grasshoppers, uh, at least uh, nine species, I think we're up to nine, maybe 10 species of caterpillars we'll find on the crop. Uh, this would be some of them right here. Um, Probably the most common and widespread ones that I hear about are various woolly bears, uh, salt marsh caterpillar and yellow woolly bear. Uh, uh, get lots of reports of this from many different areas of the country and, and these have a very wide host range and geographic range. Um, as for beetles, uh, there's a few flea beetles I've seen uh, out here. It's pale striped flea beetle. Uh, there'd be other species to the east. Um, and then southern corn rootworm, uh, it's, um, that's, that's everywhere. Uh, that's a very common associated with this crop and so many others, but not a lot of damage that I've seen uh, from any of the beetles. Moving to the east, you will find Japanese beetle on this crop, as well as southern corn rootworm, and uh, where you've got high populations of Japanese beetles, that could be an issue. Not something I see out here, uh, but uh, that could be an eastern issue. Grasshoppers, we have grasshoppers in the West, and uh, at least three species are known to be feeding on, on hemp. Uh, all of them are fairly generalists, um, and grasshopper feeding can be uh, particularly damaging because they not only will chew leaves and cause some leaf loss, but grasshoppers like to gnaw on, on branches, and uh, that will cause weakening, so you might see a stem breaking, uh, as is indicated in some of these pictures. Um, now, how bad is this uh, to all of these defoliators? Um, uh, uh, I, I think hemp can probably tolerate this kind of injury very well. And I think one of the insights in this is, um, you know, seeing how, how hemp responded to a, a hailstorm uh, that I, uh, one of the worst ones I've ever seen. Uh, it, it affected a, a melon crop across the field, across the, the road, vaporized that, and the hemp was knocked down badly. Uh, but it regrew. I mean, this is a tough plant. I have to say, it's. I mean, it's made of rope. <laughs> it's. It's tough. 
But I think there is a good research question on what's the relationship with leaf loss and uh, uh, yield. And also, um, if you have injur injuries like this, uh, does that affect THC or CBD production? Something I hope maybe this year we can get some answers on. You've got a, a whole suite of things that will suck fluids from the plant, um, mostly in the order Hemiptera, but you've got some thrips, various, uh, and, and mites as well. Uh, the big two would be aphids and leaf hoppers. You know, you've got tree hoppers, plant hoppers, some spittle bugs, some true bugs, thrips and the like, but mostly aphids and leaf hoppers. And far and away, the most common aphid uh, is the cannabis aphid. There are a couple species elsewhere that have been reported, cotton melon aphid, uh, uh, bean aphid uh, in particular, but cannabis aphid seems to be it, the big one. Um, and it's quite surprising to me to see this since it's never been found in North America before. And it's, when we find it, it's here, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, I think it had been, it, there's been a lot of confusion of this one with the hop aphid, uh, same genus, uh, fairly minor differences in, in appearance, but uh, uh, this is a separate species um, and it was newly described from North America. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. The leaf hoppers, uh, probably more species rich, uh, as far as the most species rich family of insects, at least 14 species so far, but very few of them seem to be breeding in the crop. They're just found on the crop. And in terms of damage potential, I have not seen anything other than but one Empoasca species, a uh, little green leaf hopper, make a tiny little flecking wound in the leaf, which is totally inconsequential. However, we did get a uh, confirmed report that the beet leaf hopper, which is again more of a Western deal, uh, did uh, trans, uh, is involved in transmission of beet curly top. Uh, this is the only leaf hopper transmitted virus that is known from from him. So that may be a minor issue beet curly top if you're living in a part of the country where beet leaf hopper and curly top is an issue. Um, if you're living in the east, you've got one that should be watched for the potato leaf hopper. Uh, that is known from hemp uh, and that is an insect that can cause particular injury to many kinds of crops, um, hopper burn injuries where they destroy the phloem and uh, reduce photosynthesis. Uh, so uh, people should be watching for that. I can't tell you anything about that one. Just one to keep on your radar. Uh, hemp russet mite I'll come back to. Um, this is something that occurs on the foliage, but also affects the developing flower buds and is uh, particularly important on CBD cultivars. Come back on that. Couple on stem, couple stem and stock borers you're going to see. Uh, now the European corn borer is pretty much the only one they were talking about back in World War II. Um, you know, they'd see it and it'd get in stalks and, and they would break. Now that was a pretty early, uh, that, that uh, pretty uh, point in time when European corn borer was pretty early in North America and very damaging. Um, and I, there's, it's, a, it's a question on how damaging or how important is European corn borer now. Um, a lot, it seems to be a lot less common uh, uh, than uh, the reports from the old days. Uh, very, very few people have seen it so far, but yes, it could be potentially damaging, uh, particularly on, on probably the, the ones that are being grown for fiber, where it will break the plant and ruin that plant. Uh, in, a, in a CBD cultivar, you might lose a stalk or here, there, and it just makes the plant bushier. Might even, maybe you could improve yield. I could make an argument with that. But the insect is a stock bore and, uh, and fits in many other situations. One that we need most to learn about is something called the Eurasian hemp borer. Tiny little moth, uh, tortricid, the leaf roller family, but it uh, develops almost entirely as a stock borer. It's in the same genus as uh, oriental fruit moth, if you're familiar with that insect. Uh, and it is particularly damaging to flower buds and developing seeds, but it does develop in the stems uh, of this plant, and I will come back to that. Uh, we, we are finding it in five of the six eastern counties I, I looked at last year uh, in eastern Colorado, and that's about a 600 uh, mile range extension from where it's been known. This insect is probably uh, extremely widely 
uh, distributed throughout Eastern North America, when it's been developing on feral hemp forever. Well, not forever, uh, the, at least the 60s. Um, but uh, it's not an insect that most people would notice. Uh, but this one is going to uh, uh, be a lot more important, I think. Um, I'll come back to this too. And then uh, if we move into the seeds, uh, there are uh, various kinds of bugs that feed on seeds and some things that chew on the seeds. So um, uh, the, the seed feeding hemipterans uh, potentially could be important on this crop uh, if you're growing it for seed. And there's a lot uh, you will find when the, the plants go into flower. Um, stink bugs, we've got four species in Colorado uh, that are finding on the crop. Ligus bugs, uh, two to three species in North America are known. These are all well-known kinds of insects on other crops uh, that can damage developing seed. So perhaps they may do that in hemp. Uh, we don't know. All we know is they're there. And if you're in the East, uh, you know, add brown marmorage stink bug to the list of, uh, or, or add hemp to the list of uh, plants brown marmorage stink bug feeds on. Um, Katie Britt in Virginia just put a little note on that out. Um, other families, uh, in, in the Western states, we have an insect called false chinch bugs, which is sometimes the most common insect, widespread insect uh, I'll find on, on various kinds of uh, vegetable crops and, and flowers and the like, and they'll get into hemp flowers as well, sometimes in huge numbers. And then an insect that uh, I'd never noticed, but clearly breeds in hemp and likes hemp, uh, is something called the highland grass bug. Uh, very common in, in some fields that were continuously cropped. Whether or not either of these have potential to damage the plant, uh, I think is a, is a pretty open question, uh, but uh, they are quite common. The whole thing about seed feeding bugs and hemp uh, has questions that are open. Uh, I mean, they're gonna, these are ones that concentrate their feeding on flowers and developing seed, and potentially you would have aborted seed, damaged seed, but are they abundant enough to cause significant damage? Again, it's still an open question. We shall see. You'll see the bugs, but are they going to be damaging the crop is another question. And I hope they're not damaging the crop because if we do have significant seed feeding insect pests on hemp, how are we going to manage them if we have uh, pollinators visiting the crop, particularly with the kinds of pesticides that we have available, which isn't much as we get into it. Anyway, I hope the seed feeding bugs are not a problem on this crop uh, because we'll have some management problems if they are. And then some of the chewing insects will feed on, uh, on flowers and seeds. A Japanese beetle seems to prefer um, the flowers to the leaves. Uh, zebra caterpillar out here is a very striking caterpillar, rarely seen it on other crops. It loves hemp, uh, the flowers. And uh, yellow striped armyworm seems to be more of a, a seed and flower feeder than a defoliator. And then that Eurasian hemp borer, that's another one that gets into the developing seeds. And talking about seeds and, and flowers, I, I want to separate out uh, insects that damage buds. And by buds, I mean these are, these are flower buds, but these are the buds that people are trying to produce that are not pollinated. These are going to be uh, hopefully quite large, extremely uh, high in CBD. Um, and there are two insects that will attack these, uh, in particular, corn earworm and then Eurasian hemp borer. So the way I see it, we've got at least four pests that have demonstrated potential to damage the crop, at least in this part of the country, and uh, most of these I've heard in other parts of the country as well. Uh, cannabis aphid, uh, again, is this aphid that is uh, recently uh, known to occur in, in uh, North America, but is found coast to coast in Canada. It's everywhere. Uh, undoubtedly moved around uh, by transplants, uh, probably mostly in marijuana, uh, but it's everywhere now. Um, I, I'll bet any state uh, can, you could find it if you looked it hard enough now. Uh, best we know, this is a, uh, an insect that only develops on cannabis species. Uh, this still needs to be confirmed, but it seems to be uh, uh, restricted to that genus. 
Um, it is an insect that will, when uh, day length uh, gets shorter, uh, sometime around Labor Day or so, you will see sexual forms produced. Uh, you will have males, they will mate with a, a uh, egg producing female form and they will lay eggs. The eggs in this picture are green and uh, that's what they look like as they are laid. Um, but uh, they'll turn dark uh, after that. So they look like little tiny dark jelly beans on the plants. And they will be laid uh, late September into October uh, indoors. If you uh, cut the day length down, you will trigger the production of these sexual forms. But other than that, of course, like any other aphid, most of the time it's all female forms uh, that reproduce asexually. The only time you'll see this, and by the way, this insect, for, I, for 45 years, I, looked at aphids, and this is the first time I've ever seen a male aphid, um, certainly in mating with a, another aphid, so uh, that was something I look forward to. <laughs> uh, anyway, the question comes up, how does cannabis aphids survive between seasons in a place with hard freezing winters? They're laying eggs on the, uh, the, uh, the plants late in the season. Um, mostly, it's going to be on indoor crops, people carrying it over in their production system, and then if they're using transplants and then uh, bringing them out. But uh, where we have seed production, we will have barrel hemp, and that's the way this insect normally survives season to season outdoors. If you have barrel hemp uh, or you have uh, volunteer hemp uh, in uh, uh, fields that have been seed, and that will allow them to survive. In this case, this is a field uh, last May, about a year ago today. Uh, the previous crop had been uh, a seed variety, lots of volunteers coming up, and eggs that were on the debris from the previous season crop hatched and were able to colonize those volunteers. If you do not have volunteers, this, this is not an insect that's gonna be able to survive year to year uh, within the field, but if you have a system, uh, a field that looks like this, that's how they're gonna go uh, from year to year. And again, on the feral hemp, where the same kind of situation occurs. Are there alternative crops for cannabis aphid? We don't know yet, but I don't think so. Uh, so we've tried some trials on this, but we'll maybe get that figured out this year. And and hops aphid is sometimes, a, a hop aphid is sometimes uh, mentioned as being on cannabis. And I don't think that's correct. I think that's a misidentification, but. Uh, stay tuned, you know, we'll keep learning things. Every time I see a hemp field, I, I learn something new. It's all, it's very, very interesting. And then this um, hemp russet mite. This is, this is something that until uh, the people during the winter meetings told me that this is something that's serious in the fields, uh, as well as in uh, indoor production, I, I had not really given much thought to it. And I did not, not know anything about it. This a year ago, you know, pretty much these two pictures on the upper left and the upper right, you can find them in Bug Guide by Carl Hillig from Indiana. That's what, you know, that's, those are the pictures of a hemp russet mite that, that I'd seen. And uh, so, you know, a couple of things, you know, one of the things is you see that leaf curl. Is this upward leaf curl a symptom of hemp russet mite? That's, that's, that's what I look for because that's what the picture showed. And um, yes and no. Uh, I mean, some cultivars do produce an upward leaf curl when you have hemp russet mites, and some don't. And some genotypes um, will produce the same kind of curl. So uh, if you're going with that leaf curl symptom, that's um, uh, not going to always uh, be very, very useful uh, and may get you uh, in, in the wrong place. Uh, the symptoms of it are very subtle, um, much more subtle, and it's kind of a graying, maybe a russeting if you want, uh, from the damage they'll do. So the leaves are a little smaller, they're a little off color, you don't get the strong stippling uh, that you would from a, a spider mite, since these russet mites are, are so tiny, they can only feed on the, the outermost layer of cells, the epidermis, um, and uh, uh, what is particularly uh, problematic with this species is when they get on the developing flower buds and the flower buds, those things that ideally would become gross and grossly enlarged, uh, they become uh, 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 quite small and uh, uh, 
yields are cut in that regard. Uh, they're probably also damaging a lot of the trichomes uh, uh, from which some of the resins are produced that are uh, desirable in a CBD crop. Dispersal, you know, aerified mites blow. I mean, they're just like pollen, pollen with legs on is why I think it, but uh, people worry about them carrying them on their clothes or carrying, you know, some, some the, you go to a, a field and they're blowing all over the place. So that's how aerified mites normally disperse. Um, and uh, uh, that's how they're colonizing new plants. In the field, uh, we've only looked at one field through the season, and by we, I mean uh, Melissa Schreiner, who does all the work for me, uh, uh, this graduate student. Anyway, um, but uh, we can see that there was very steady uh, increase in populations. This would be numbers of russet mites per leaves. Of course, the plants are getting bigger too. But it, you know, it, it increased uh, ninefold over the season. Didn't, you know, uh, they weren't uh, back to back uh, on the plants by the end. Uh, probably a lot of them just kept dispersing to new plants, being windblown. Um, but I don't know what are the natural enemies of hemp russet mites in the field. I mean, the only only credible thing poss possibly would be minute pirate bugs. They're the only predators I see that are small enough that might eat a russet mite, but they're probably too big to be interested in them. I don't know. We don't see uh, uh, predatory mites in fields in Colorado. It's, uh, I think it's because it's too dry. Uh, we've introduced them and they don't take. But predator mites might be important in other places for russet mites, just not in an arid area. Um, how does it survive through winter? That's a good question. I, I was finding mites on a volunteer plant on June 18. Uh, the plant was next to a building used to dry plants in the previous crop, but there, there was a long period when there was no green material and it was very cold. Perhaps there's some bridge plant, some living host, uh, some perennial plant, uh, a winter annual perennial um, field bindweed or, or some winter mustard. Anyway, something to be looked at. Lots of questions on hemp russet mite. You know, how does it survive outdoors? What are its natural controls? How damaging is it? Uh, let's get, we need to get economic injury levels. What products can be used to manage them? Uh, done a little bit of work on that. Uh, looks like some of the oils are, are, are best. And then this Eurasian hemp borer, I mentioned a couple of times. So again, a tiny moth. Uh, develops primarily in the stalks. Uh, eggs are laid externally, and then uh, within a, a very short period after egg hatch, it will go into a stem of a plant. Um, so this would be um, a plant that, again, looked at June last year. Uh, you can see the split stalk, uh, and on the right, a little swelling where the, the bore had been. Uh, it, it, the reason I show this is, is that these are fairly advanced larvae in June 18, so there was uh, probably a flight going on in early May. We're going to have multiple generations of this insect. Um, different kinds of symptoms. If it's in the stalk, uh, you might see some tunneling and a little swelling, but often that's not very visible. But an area where there's a leaf near there, that might flag. So you might see a, a little bit of flagging, and then if you go to the base of that symptom, cut it, and you'll see the uh, developing larva. Uh, late in the season, uh, these will move into buds, and those little buds, those flower buds that ultimately might be an important source of seed or, or uh, buds for CBD, uh, will be destroyed, incidental to this. And although I have not seen it, they are, are um, supposed to also go into the developing seed heads late. And so some people will, will see them chewing on them, or when they harvest their seed, they've got all these little uh, caterpillars. And the caterpillars I'm showing you are all kind of pale colored here, but uh, the last stage of the Eurasian hemp borer, like the oriental fruit moth, its relative, turns kind of a pinkish uh, orange color. Uh, so it's the same insect, just the last instar looks a little different. Serious damage to buds was particularly observed in one field this year. Uh, so this would be what you'd see the buds just die because they've been uh, tunneled underneath. And I, I really think this, is, this could be the potential key pest of this crop if we're gonna be growing it for, for seed. And presently it's only known uh, east of the Rockies, but I would not be surprised if some 
Bozo brought uh, infested cu uh, cultivars into Oregon or Washington or California, and you have it there. Um, but uh, we'll uh, we'll see about that. Uh, but this is one to watch, I think. Tried pheromone traps. We need a pheromone trap for this. We don't have one. I've tried the ones for other Graphalita species. We're in fruit worm, cherry fruit worm, lesser apple worm. They're not catching it. So that's a good project for somebody to work on. Um, and there must be some other plants that this insect is developing on. Maybe some knotweed, maybe hops, something. Uh, it, just for it to show up so commonly in an area um, where there really had been no uh, uh, hemp production prior to this uh, makes me think there must be some wild host for Eurasian hemp war. I don't know what it is, but maybe next year we'll know. The insect that has caused by far the most damage to crops in the field and over a wide area is the corn earworm. This is an insect that is also known as the tomato fruit worm. It's also known as the boll worm. Uh, it's one of the most common and important uh, pests of a wide variety of crops in this, the United States. It's found in all kinds of hemp, but particularly in CBD forms, uh, attacks the plant after flowering. Uh, like in any other crop, this corn earworm is uh, got a lot of variation in patterning. So you can see pink forms, you can see dark forms uh, and the like, but this is all corn earworm uh, developing in hemp. Uh, the damage it does is it will ream those developing buds, which are the, the primary part that you're growing uh, if you're particularly for CBD uh, crops. So extensively damaging, uh, almost entire crop losses have been reported in uh, some areas during outbreak years. Key questions involved, what kind of plant growth stage makes hemp attractive? Um, uh, and it's going to be some kind of flowering stage. It'd be nice to get that down uh, so that we could time treatments a little bit better. Uh, I would think risk factor for corn earworm is probably the, uh, it's the location of the fields near corn. Hemp becomes attractive late in the season after corn uh, becomes unattractive. So uh, they would be coming out of corn from the previous demonstration. Uh, uh, previous generation and then find hemp to be one of the few crops that would be uh, suitable for it late in the season. But this insect flies long distances. So even if you're quite distant from cornfield, you could easily be infested. So we've had big outbreaks of this in 2016 and 2018 in southeastern Colorado. Uh, and this just shows uh, one, one capture one night when I happen to have a light trap out down in Rocky Ford. Um, we got a sheet on this. Uh, we've got sheets on all of these insects at the hemp insect website. Uh, also have for this one, a proposed pest management plan, uh, largely uh, uh, taken from uh, how you would manage corn earworm in sweet corn. Uh, basically it involves a, uh, me, sorry here. Uh, involves use of traps, pheromone traps, there, got it. Pheromone traps, uh, using the Heliothus trap to uh, monitor for this. Um, and uh, uh, if you are monitoring throughout the season uh, and you get, get some idea of what normal populations are, uh, then when the uh, crop becomes uh, more susceptible to this insect late in the season, if you see very high numbers of moss, then you could treat. Uh, so we're recommending uh, you treat if you're finding very high numbers of moths late in the season when the, the uh, buds are there. There are two products that I recommend. One would be the Azawi strain of BT, not the Kerstaki strain. The Azawi strain is a little better on cutworms. And then there is a uh, NPV virus. Uh, the, um, these, so these are the, ah, so these are the, the two ones that uh, products we, uh, uh, do recommend here that are allowed to be used in this state, and I'll get to that in just a sec, uh, what's allowable and what's not. Um, pollinator use uh, could complicate controls if there are pests in the crop during flowering. I've already mentioned this. Fortunately, these BT products and the uh, NPV are quite selective and probably are compatible with pollinators. 
We put uh, traps out in with seven growers, eight counties in two two sites last year where there were high enough numbers uh, for the uh, uh, insect to be um, uh, cause potential damage and they were sprayed. The three growers treated for corn earworm last year. The others did not because the traps told them there was not a problem and there wasn't. Now, this brings up the last thing I need to talk about, this whole issue about pesticide use on, on any kind of cannabis crop, hemp, whatever. Uh, it's a real screwed up situation. And that's because you know, all registered pesticides can only be applied to sites that are consistent with the way the label is written. And presently, the agency that normally deals with all this, the EPA doesn't recognize cannabis as a crop site because of the legal issues. So the question is, are there pesticides that can be used in this crop now? And uh, I would say that there is, let me get to this. Because the EPA is not dealing with this issue, um, this whole issue of what pesticides can be used on a hemp crop or any other cannabis crop has devolved to the states. Totally bizarre situation. And different states have done different things. Most states have completely ignored this issue. They provide no guidance, uh, or they say, you know, there's no registered pesticides, there's no guidance. Some states, I'm thinking Maine, I'm thinking California, provide some vague guidelines of some kinds of registered pesticide products that might be allowable. But the way I think this should be done is what I call the state finesse that's being ha handled by a couple states where a, a list of specific allowable products is provided. This approach to pesticide registration was first broached by uh, Washington State in 2013 because they had to deal with it in marijuana originally and they came up with what I consider the Washington finesse, Washington State finesse or state finesse and there are certain kinds of things that are involved in uh, the thinking to allow certain products on use of this, this crop at this time. And these, and I'll go through these in detail in just a sec, but, but key things are uh, that it is a pesticide that is exempt from food crop tolerances and that the way the label is written, it does not preclude its use on hemp if you read the label uh, in a specific way. So in this system, uh, states will provide specific lists of products that are allowable under the guidelines of their state. Uh, so this would be part, you know, page one of a list from Washington State. Colorado does this, and uh, let me go through this in more detail with uh, um, Colorado borrowed uh, what uh, Washington did and some other states have borrowed it also. So basically what we have is if you have pesticides that require federal registration uh, to be considered to be used on hemp, the active ingredient has to be required from food crop, has to be exempt from food crop tolerance. Um, but the second thing, and this is what makes it uh, consistent with federal label law, I think, is that you have a label that it's not only exempt from food crop tolerances, but the label has use instructions that are so broadly written that it uh, allows one to uh, interpret that it's not prohibited, the use is not prohibited. And I don't know if any of you spend much time looking at labels, but uh, often they are very you know, specific. This crop, this crop, this crop, and this crop. But occasionally, some things like in this case, a pyrethrins product, you see labeling such as crops including, but not limited to. That would be interpreted as a kind of product that would be allowable for use uh, because it does not prohibit hemp. Yeah. It has to be registered by the state, and in our state, it also has to be registered on tobacco, not only exempt from food crop tolerances, but have a tobacco registration. Then there are the Section 25B products, which do not require federal registration. These are mostly uh, uh, various essential oils and the like. Uh, and that's what you have um, they, they, uh, uh, if you do not allow uh, federally registered products. So, in Colorado, Department of Ag retains, retains a website of pesticides that may be applied. You just do a web search on cannabis pesticides, whatever your state is, Colorado in this case. You come to this page, brings up the list. And that is what we can use. This is a 
uh, list that is done by um, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and Nevada. I don't think any other states have gone this route, but I recommend all of them. By the way, the list of products that you come up with, essentially all of them are allowed for certified organic uh, as well. Um, so where are we now? Um, I see you know, the whole way we've approached the pesticide use regulations in, in various kinds of cannabis species crops, having a phase one, a wild west phase, and I see many states still being there. Uh, phase two is a state finesse phase, and the phase three would be a normalization. When it is finally reg federally registered as uh, recognized as a crop and regulated as a crop. However, when hemp grows up as a crop and is addressed by federal laws and regulations, how will the pesticide issue work out? It's going to vary depending on what kind of hemp we're talking about. There's hemp and there's hemp. I mean, I, I see, you know, if, if uh, the EPA uh, steps up and, and regulates uh, hemp, uh, the, the, the five the, the, the products that are grown just for seed, um, heck, that's just another oil seed crop, uh, like a sunflower, cotton. It could be a, a crop group 20. Why not? If it's grown for fiber, oh my goodness. I mean, what, you know, probably uh, even a wider use of pesticides could be allowed if you consider just an, a fiber crop. Um, however, the CBD thing, this is, this poses some more serious registrations and I, uh, issues, and I don't see us getting a lot of new pesticides other than uh, what uh, some of the Western states are, are uh, allowing use. Because with CBD, you are producing a crop that is ingested by humans, it's put on their skin, uh, it's inhaled in some cases. Um, these all require uh, medical studies in terms of uh, what kind of residues are being car uh, uh, carried forth. Also, this is an extracted compound. People extract the CBD using CO2 or uh, various other compounds. And uh, no, studies haven't been done in terms of uh, how the residues come out in that. Um, I do try to keep this stuff up on this uh, Colorado Hemp Insect website. I think if you just do a hemp insect website on a web search, it comes up. Try to have fact sheets on all the insects we see, images of them. Um, got a thing called Got Bugs for people to uh, uh, send in pictures. Uh, I encourage you all to use this. Um, it does get a lot of use, all 50 states. Uh, and then that's it. I got one minute. <laughs> Did it. I did it. My 157 slides. You didn't think I would. Yeah, I didn't think you would. <laughs> okay, so yeah. now, we've, now we've got uh, questions. Yeah, um, I was going to say we have, uh, we're just around at two o'clock and we're, uh, we are uh, scheduled to keep going until 2.30 if we need to, but we'll go through some questions that have come in and, um, and then we have some final uh, questions uh, for you and, and some materials to share. So uh, let's, uh, Nancy, you've been monitoring uh, the questions. Uh, do, would you like to ask, uh, ask those for Whitney? Sure. We have two questions about pollen. Will the uh, uh, one uh, listener has an apiary and he wants to know if hemp pollen will adversely affect the taste of the honey? Uh. They, hemp does not produce nectar, so they're not going to be taking it into uh, uh, the nectar. So I don't see, you know, other than a few grains uh, uh, of pollen getting into the honey, you know, I don't see that being a, a conflict. Um, so it's, so it's, it's, not, it's not a nectar source. It's only a pollen source. So I don't think it would affect the taste. I, I don't think I, I haven't tasted hemp pollen, but I don't think it'd be any different from any other kind of pollen getting into, in, into the honey. And the second, the second pollen question is, do you see any effects of CBD in honey made from hemp pollen? Uh, no. no. It, 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 um, I, nobody's looked at that. I mean, you know, so, so nobody's, I mean, the, the most important thing I think is, is uh, what kind of quality uh, is hemp pollen for bees? Does it bring anything to the table that's good or particularly good? Uh, is it uh, very, is it a healthful kind of pollen for for bees. Um, uh, there are some people starting to look at that. Um, all I know is they love it and uh, um, all kinds of bees. I mean, just uh, just fields are just buzzing like crazy. So I'm sorry, I probably can't answer the, those questions all that well. Sorry. This, Give me is another a, one. this is an insect question, I believe. Which strain of ECB is more likely? 
I don't know. I have not, I haven't seen ECB in a field yet. And I've only heard two people say they've seen it. It is so uncommon. Uh, you know, it's, it's so far, it's been a non-issue. So um, that, uh, that has to be resolved. That's, that's, you know, we, we barely get European corn borer, so I haven't seen it. But nobody is complaining about corn borer, I can tell. People are sometimes mixing corn borer with uh, uh, corn earworm you know, or mixing corn borer with Eurasian hemp borer. I think that's, there's a lot of confusion on that. But I don't think there's a lot of European corn borer in, in hemp, but I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. A uh, question about uh, risks of contamination of flour with BT. How long before a harvest are you recommending application? Well, BT has a has a zero pre-harvest interval, um, but uh, you would want to do it. Um, uh, you, you, you'd be targeting young larvae before they get big, and uh, I would I would time it for the uh, um, for the for the flight. Uh, 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 when, when flights occur, when you've got susceptible plants, it, it, the plant may become less susceptible as the uh, buds uh, mature. So uh, anyway, it would be, you, you wouldn't need to do it uh, more than uh, within two or three weeks of, of harvest, uh, I don't think. I mean, you, you're going after the hatching eggs and the young larvae. So I, I would think there could be at least a two or three week uh, uh, bump, but, you know, when you wouldn't need to treat at all. I mean, there'd just be young larvae that weren't damaging too much. So, ah, I, you know, it's, it's a zero pre-harvest interval, but probably would be best used, you know, up to maybe a couple weeks before harvest, if you had a problem. Next one. Has there been any information found on nematode damage on hemp? Not that I know of, no. Uh, soil issues are totally uh, un undescribed. There are some nematodes that are known to attack hemp, uh, in the literature, but no, no real work's been done on, in North America in that yet. Is glyphosate legal to use pre-plant? Uh, probably not in the way we interpret it in our state. Um, you'd have to ask your state department. Every, every state is, every state is so different. Cal in in uh, um, some states, it probably is clearly not. I don't know. Um, I don't think it'd be allowable in Colorado. Uh, so Gary Fish, back to the ECB question, says ECB has been found in Maine hemp. Okay, yeah, it's, you know, it's around. I just, uh, but I don't know Eurasian hemp borers up in Vermont, so that's also probably up in Maine too. Next question, are there pests that generate stress factors to cause hermaphroditic traits in plants grown for CBD? Mm. I don't know. Um, the whole, no, I mean that, you know, nobody knows uh, much about what, what uh, uh, causes hemp to pr uh, produce uh, hermaphrodites uh, of any kind, you know, whether it's insect injury or not. No, I don't know. I mean, we're, 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 we're in the first inning of trying to figure out this, this game here. Uh, so stuff like that is something that uh, would be great to look at, but no, we're not there yet. Ask, yeah, come back in two years, three years. What kind of trials are you allowed to conduct as a university researcher? What that I can conduct? I mean, the trials that uh, 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 we're doing uh, several trials. Uh, one of them would be um, uh, going to be doing this. Uh, we're going to be uh, simulated um, hail damage uh, because we get lots of hail. Plus, it will also give an idea of what a defoliator might do. But also, again, try to see if it's affecting CBD and THC, not just yield. Uh, we're looking at various products for hemp russet mite, um, ways to disinfest plants, lots of different things. Um, but uh, there's plenty of things to do, and there's not a lot of people looking at this yet. I mean, I've been able to work on it a little bit earlier than some because I live in Colorado, uh, but I think a lot more people will be looking at this crop this year, and I hope they all do. Uh, are there economic thresholds being established for industrial hemp or CBD hemp on economic yield loss versus pest presence versus price of commodity? No, because I mean, also uh, not yet. I mean, that's, that's, that's where you always end up with, but um, uh, I mean, we, we need to do the studies to figure out how uh, damaging these, these insects are. That's a set of studies. And then the economics, holy cow, the economics of this are so screwed up right now. I mean, what figure do you pump in? I mean, a, a price for the crop that was good a year ago might not be, 
you know, and it might not all be relevant the next year. Uh, no, that's, yeah, that's where you go. That's where you move to. That's where, we, you know, is economic thresholds. And then, uh, but so much is not, is unknown about this crop. Are you preparing publications about your hemp work? In my institution, they are saying that a publication is a recommendation and we cannot publish even a fact sheet. I, I do lots of fact sheets. They're all in the hemp insect website. I've been doing them for years. Um, so um, I, I, I can only do it for hemp. I cannot do it for marijuana. Uh, that's, I mean, we're absolutely prohibited from that, but not for hemp. We're, uh, with, since the farm bill, we're, we're allowed to do that. We can talk about him, at least in my state. And I'm going to die to ask questions because there's a funky with, with Nancy's sound. So I'm just going to mute and then, there we go. All right. Um, so will uh, bees pollinate uh, low THC crops um, with high THC pollen and cause undesirable hybrids in the next year? Uh, that's possible, but uh, you'll, you'll get... Uh, um, you're, I mean, since it's wind pollinated, uh, uh, pollen is blowing all over. You're going to get uh, uh, contamination from wind pollination. That happens all over, you know, all over the place from feral hemp. If you have feral hemp anywhere nearby, uh, you're going to get uh, you're going to get um, uh, pollen in your crop and, and mess it up. The bees will be minor. The wind blown uh, pollen is 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 huge. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and then uh, this one, it sounds like you may not be able to answer. Um, if a pest is a problem towards the end of flowering, what treatment methods are able to be used uh, that would have a proper half-life uh, to still be able to be consumed? Uh, well, the BT products, again, can be used fairly close to harvest, uh, and that's about the only thing that would work on uh, the, uh, uh, the caterpillars. Um, I don't know what else. I mean, some people will harvest plants and hang them up and then shake the plants to shake out all the corn earworms, but that's about it. Um, you can get chickens, I guess, and run around and eat them, but I, no, I don't know <laughs> what else you got. Don't have a lot of options with this crop. <laughs> I mean, um, have you uh, seen or got any uh, reports about phytoplasms? No, um, and the uh, obvious one would be um, uh, aster yellows. Uh, that goes to an awful lot of plants, but there's no report of any phytoplasmas that I'm aware of uh, going to uh, any cannabis plant anywhere on the planet to, to date, uh, but that, that could happen. But Astra yellows is the one I'd look for. I mean, beet curly top is the common widespread virus in, in the Western US and Astra yellows is the leaf hopper transmitted disease that's common in Eastern US. So look for that, but it may not go to hemp. I don't know. That'd be the one I'd think of. Okay. And uh, um, Odd feedback here. Um, uh, so anyway, um, I might uh, butcher the pronunciation here, but uh, Bemisima tabaki will have a potential to damage hemp directly and indirectly through virus transmission. And a question mark. Uh, Bemisia tabaci, the, the sweet potato whitefly, definitely goes to hemp. Uh, well, it, it goes. It's known uh, marijuana anyway, but I'm sure it goes to hemp. Um, the kinds of uh, viruses that transmits are not known to go to hemp yet. Uh, they, they do transmit a few, uh, but none of them have been confirmed from, from hemp as far as I know. Uh, there's no white fly transmitted viruses known from hemp, but that could change. I mean, people haven't been looking at it. I mean, you know, I, mean I, I would start looking for uh, uh, that if I was growing hemp in Florida, someplace where there's a lot of those Plamesia tabaci transmitted viruses. So I wouldn't be surprised that if it did, but I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. All right. Is there an ideal crop rotation for a follower crop for the insect reduction? Uh, no, I mean, just something that keeps the volunteers down. You don't want the volunteers. Uh, it's a pretty different plant from, from many others. So I think a lot of, crops would uh, work well in rotation. Um, it just, the problems with, with hemp is when you're doing continuous uh, production in the same field, which a lot of people are because they've just got one piece of ground. It's, that's gonna cause some problems. But, uh, I feel so stupid. I don't know all these questions. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> it's not, it, <laughs> Yeah, no, to me actually, it's, a, it's an indication of wisdom.
them <laughs> to knowing when to, yeah and the confidence the confidence to say you know rather than making something up and and it's and it's actually pretty pretty interesting to 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 see this in an in a in a field right so yeah yeah um so what species of photo say it's prey on the russet mite Good question. I don't know. Um, I tried Amblyceus californicus, uh, and I could not get them to, to feed. But I have never, again, I have never seen uh, any uh, predator mites work in any crop uh, uh, out here because it's too dry. And uh, I mean, we've got, you know, 30% relative humidity. These predators need 50 to 80% relative humidity to do well. So they'll probably do great in the east. That being said, I mean, this is, this is, one of the trials that I would like to get done is to uh, uh, establish hemp russet mite colonies and try the different predators. Um, but uh, that hasn't been done. That's a, that's the you know sixty four thousand dollar question a lot of people are asking. But a lot of you know we, what we know is, is several pre predatory mites don't eat russet mites, and it's going to be hard finding the ones that do. I mean, some anyway. It's there's some things that have been said uh, in the internet. I, I need to see proof. I want to see I want to see university studies on this stuff, and we don't have that yet. Okay. Um, Bruce Stedman, uh, how do we help you with specific studies that you'll be developing? Spray systems and timing, plot layout, scouting, and trapping systems. And that's being asked by uh, he's uh, he's in Maine. And actually, I know we have Gary Fish from Maine, who's also been answering some questions on the chat too. So, um, I, I mean, the big things are, I think, trying try to um, uh, understand what's uh, on the crop where you live, uh, make observations on if they're doing damage. Um, uh, on some of these. Um, we need to figure out life history information. I mean, again, this Eurasian hemp borer, which may or may not be a big deal in Maine, but um, in a number of generations uh, on that, any any kind of traps, um, again, we need somebody to figure out the pheromone for this, but uh, um, I don't know. Uh, just you know, making observations some and sharing it. I mean, again, I do have a, I am trying with a website, hemp website to try to get some kind of discussion going on some of the issues we're seeing. Uh, you know, I'd certainly like to hear what, what you see, uh, but uh, for specific trials, again, I, I can't recommend products uh, uh, because each state does it differently and I'm a little leery about recommending anything, you know, for something in Maine. Although I think Maine has, from what I can tell, has, has addressed this issue to a fairly good degree. But, every, you know, Every state is doing this differently. The pesticide issue is so screwed up. I've never worked with a crop that was remotely as screwed up as this is regarding pesticide use. Nothing, nothing close. It's ridiculous. Okay. Um, and um, okay, and I'm just going through here looking for uh, questions. Does the sticky stuff in hemp uh, help trap insects? I uh, I would think it would trap a lot of insects. I mean, you see little flies and stuff get caught. Um, it could also uh, easily, uh, it could also potentially affect uh, predators. I mean, uh, some of these, if they get really gooey, I would think a lot of uh, kinds of predators would not be very efficient uh, in, in, a, in a very gooey plant from, from uh, uh, the resins. Um, I think these plants get, some of them get too gooey. People want to get high CBD and uh, uh, really jack it up and that may be something where you have some negative consequences, among other things, is that you can't harvest it very easily. You can't put it through a harvester because it just sticks to the inside of the harvester. Mm. Uh, but also, I'm sure it will interfere with natural enemies. Um, um, and Jacqueline Coburn asks, um, has there been any information found on nematode damage on hemp? No, again, I... I there, I get, there's, there's, in that book uh, by hemp diseases and, and uh, pests, uh, there's several nematodes that are mentioned uh, worldwide, um, but that's it. That's all that I think is known about the subject. So, I mean, if somebody knew, if this is a nematologist talking about this, go figure it out. Go out and look. I mean, there's all this, there's all this low hanging fruit. We, we need to figure this out. You know, anyway. So. Okay. 
Um, so this is a question um, somebody asked, what are the actions that they could take to encourage recognition from the reg regulatory agencies? And that you may be a question you don't want to touch, so I'll let you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what is holding up uh, this being addressed at the federal level. Um, partic you know, I hope that with the new language in the Farm Bill that this will be addressed. Um, I don't know what they'll then resolve, but um, you know, again, I do see, you know, it, it makes sense to me that um, if, uh, it would be fairly easy to regulate fiber and seed hemp uh, at the federal level, but not uh, the CBD stuff's gonna be more complicated. I don't know, I don't know what's been, nobody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to, you know, it's, it's, it's in limbo. It's, it's, it's in a screw, screwy area because of the long history uh, of cannabis sativa in the United States. So I don't know, maybe they're looking at it at the EPA. I haven't heard squat. Okay. And I think we have one last question and the rest are comments. Um, so Jaya, uh, Judd said, risks of contamination of flower with, uh, uh, flowers with BT and how long before harvest are you recommending application? And then he put a couple of other comments. Everyone seems to use it uh, like it's nothing and I've heard that it's not all safe. Um, and the strain you recommend in particular, is anything sprayed on flowers uh, that could be smoked or vaporized makes me nervous. Okay, I think that's a good okay, yeah, no. I mean, they, there's the virus too, at least in our state. It's not BT. Um, it's a selective virus on uh, Heliothus species and Hel Helicoverpa species, I guess. Okay. There. Uh, great. Um, and uh, Lance Osborne asked if there are any projects you're looking for cooperators on. The other thing is uh, what's coming up actually in one of the other slides is we have a find a colleague uh, page on our website for the Northeast IPM where you can put in information and um, so there's like cross pollination for people to find. Oh, there you go. Uh, when you put up the link for us, um, that you can enter your information and find out who's working in the region on different on different topics. And this is for everything, but um, I'd encourage you to have a look in there. And if you are somebody who wants to collaborate, to put your information in, and it's a good way for people to find each other. And um, and so for you, I don't know if Lance is in our region or in your region, but are there any projects that you're looking for cooperators on? Uh, mostly uh, just. Uh, describing what, what there is uh, for um, uh, just, uh, you know, finding out what you have. If anybody's got insects that they want identified that they're seeing, uh, get pictures of it. Uh, maybe we, we can uh, if, if, uh, get samples of it. I'd particularly like to uh, see some of the things that I haven't mentioned. Uh, I'm different aphids. I'm, I'd like to uh, see some of the other aphids. I don't know. Um, as for specific research, uh, again, that's a little hard to do across uh, uh, state lines right now, um, and I'm pretty much filled up with what I can do here in Colorado. Okay. By the way, you just have to say, there's just no money for this either. Everything I've done is done with couch change. I mean, it's it's really hard to get funding for this. Um, so you're not gonna. That's that's also been an impediment. So maybe at the federal level, if there could be uh, 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 research to work on the pest management of this this crop, that would be huge. But it'll take a couple of years for there to be uh, benefits trickling to the, the producers. And everybody wants answers today or yesterday or last year. And it looks like we have one last question, if you're willing. Um, um, this is a, a several part. Are there irrigation methods that either help or prevent any of these pests? I know that bindweed mite is specifically prevented from colonizing a field infested with bindweed under overhead irrigation. Could this be true for russet as well? Um, overhead irrigation probably would um, uh, cut down russet mites. It'd probably cut down uh, thrips. Um, the little stuff, it would, it would wash it off. Overhead irrigation, on the other hand, would likely uh, aggravate uh, plant pathogens. And I have not talked about that, but uh, plant pathogens can be, could probably be uh, far more damaging to crops in areas, particularly uh, where you uh, have, have steady rainfall and, and uh, situations for fungi or bacteria to grow. Uh, fortunately, where I live, uh, with very little rainfall, um, we do not have a lot of plant uh, pathogens on the leaves, but you know, the last thing you'd want to do in a, in a wet place is keep the leaves wetter than they are already, uh, or you'll just get clean your clock with some, some uh, fungus. Yeah. 
Terrific. Well, thank you. I think we've I think we've answered all the questions that came in. I think the rest are comments. And um, I also want to acknowledge Gary Fish from Maine has been on here uh, answering some of the questions that have been coming through to you and giving comments. And um, so if we want to uh, answer, uh, we have some questions left for uh, for folks. Um, there are actually similar questions that we had in the beginning. There are a couple more too. And um, so if we can start the poll. And um, if I can just ask you for a couple of minutes to um, answer these questions and then uh, Whitney will go over the answers. So, okay, so I'm gonna end the poll. We had 77% of the people voting and uh, I can see the results here. Um, so we've had an uptick in people who consider themselves uh, moderately knowledgeable, so that's excellent. Uh, what is the most important insect pest that attacks buds in developing flowers on hemp? And Whitney, I'll let you take this away. Well, I would say it's definitely corn earworm. Um, I, it, it's sometimes misdescribed as, as army worm or something else, but um, I mean, people, I've seen pictures of this from Nevada, from Wisconsin, from uh, North Carolina, from Virginia, I mean, from uh, uh, Vermont. I mean, it's, so, so you know, corn borer comes up, I, I want to see that, uh, and this question is also what's going into the flowers of hemp. European corn borer is going to go into the stock. It's going into the flowers. It's not European corn borer. Um, it could be Eurasian hemp borer. It's, corn borer is going to be in the stock. So anyway, so I think I'm pretty confident about that, that answer there. And to what extent do pollinating insects use hemp? It can be heavily used. And again, I think it's particularly going to be heavily used um, in areas where there's a dearth of alternative flowering plants at the time hemp pollen is available. Again, maybe way more important out here than it might be in uh, upstate New York. But, um, and then the regulations, this is, this is a, it's up to you. Uh, so this is, looks like there's a, um, a range of uh, how people have responded. Uh, a big, big one is either no formulations, uh, reg regulations have been formulated, which is what the majority of states have done. If they have a specific products, so that's the people from the West Slope, I mean, the West, uh, Western US. Uh, those are the states that have the specific uh, lists. Best mm -hmm. the only four states, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, and Colorado. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I think we have, uh, we just want to acknowledge uh, the source of uh, funding for, for folks to take the time to do this. Um, We're here at the Northeastern IPM Center. We're funded uh, through NIFR at USDA. And um, also a lot of uh, Whitney's work was, uh, has been funded through the Western IPM Center and the Colorado Agricultural Experiment Station. And um, so we want to say thank you to uh, those organizations for making it possible for, for us to take the time to do this. And, um, and uh, yeah, I want to just say thank you very much to Whitney for uh, developing such a, um, a, a long ranging and uh, broad and deep career so that you can jump into this and uh, bring so much wisdom and knowledge to, uh, to the table about what are the good questions to be asking and, and what you're seeing so far. So thank you for, thank you for taking the time to put all of this together. It was, uh, it was a huge undertaking to do and I appreciate it. Yeah, no, my pleasure. It's a very interesting uh, situation. And in two more years from now, we'll know a heck of a lot more than we know right now. Okay, well then I can hear two years from now, there'll be another toolbox. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and if folks want to, uh, we're always looking for suggestions about Toolbox uh, webinars. So if you have another topic that you'd like to see us cover, um, or you know another person who would be a good expert to bring in on another topic, let us know. And uh, thank you for your time and participation.